Let us all stand. Let us prepare our heart. <clears throat> hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this beautiful morning, Lord, that we are here to worship you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. This morning, Father, we look for your presence, Father. Father, come and have your way, Lord. In this room, Lord, we want your presence, Father. We want to worship you, Lord, this morning. Hallelujah. We welcome you, Father. Prepare our hearts, Father, Lord. Prepare our hearts, Father, this morning to hear from you, Lord. To worship you, Lord. To adore you, Lord. Hallelujah. We welcome you, Father, in this place. Come and move in this place, Lord. As we worship you, Lord. Come and move and touch our hearts this morning, Lord. And we long for you, Lord. We long for you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, Father. We bless your name this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. church let us worship and adore him in this place you can open your mouth you can clap your hands you can dance let's give him the best we can this morning <clears throat> Yeah. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you. We thank you for everything, Lord, this morning. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the bread that you put into our lungs this morning. So we stand and we worship you this morning, Lord. We give you worship, Lord, this morning. Come on, church, let us give what all we have this morning to him, to our King. Hallelujah. Because he's the one who gives life. He was the one who restores us when we were broken. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for you are our hope. And this morning, we are going to worship you, Lord. So we 
pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you, oh, Lord, great are you, Lord, oh, we sing.
us continue to bless his name he is already here we'll repeat this co we'll repeat this course and we'll just thank him because he is great hallelujah word says that all the earth praise the name of the lord the sun and the moon praise his name in psalms 148 he says or oh, to all the animals also praise his name all the creation adores our god hallelujah this morning we adore him hallelujah lord we adore you we bless you lord hallelujah Shout your praise. Sing it out. Our hearts will cry. 
Bless his holy name. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. Hallelujah. You are touching the lives. You are moving. Hallelujah. You are filling us. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless your holy name. There is none holy like you, Lord. Hallelujah. You are wonderful. You are wonderful. King of glory. Lord of lords. King of kings, you are holy, hallelujah. Let your name be lifted high in this place, Lord. Let your name be lifted high in our lives. Let your name be lifted high in your church, Lord, hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you, holy name. We bless your holy name. With everything we have, Lord, we bless your holy name, hallelujah. This morning, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your cross, Lord. We thank you for your nail piece hand. We thank you, Lord, for the crown of thorns. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for you were rejected for our sake, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your precious blood, hallelujah. You indeed are great, Lord, hallelujah. And your name is above every name, hallelujah. In all the earth, in all the creation, your name is above every other name. There is no other name but the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful Father, thank you, Lord. Today, Lord, you speak with us, Lord. Speak to us, Lord, through your word. And fill us, Lord. Open our hearts and open our minds, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your mighty name, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Please be seated. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning great is thy faithfulness O Lord great is thy faithfulness the steadfast love of the Lord never sees his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is 
thy faithfulness, O Lord, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, open our eyes to see wonderful things from your word. Transform us, Lord, by the power of your word. Let your word fall as a hammer on our hearts, Lord Jesus. Let your word illuminate us, Lord Jesus. We ask and thank you in Jesus' name. I today have a very basic uh, message for you. Uh, after all that I preached in the last many Sundays, I felt that we should uh, talk about something very basic, which is how to have effective private time with God. Because whether it is the finished work of the cross that I preached on, or whether it is discerning the times or the timing, or whether it is seeing things from God's eyes, eventually it boils down to you working with the Word. And the private time you have with God, it cannot, it's not, it cannot be substituted by meeting in the church. Likewise, your meeting God alone cannot be substituted for not meeting with the body, yes, of Christ. And what's interesting is that, in, for example, if you look at Leviticus also, the, in Leviticus, the theology of Leviticus is the holiness of God, yes, it talks to the holiness of God. But Leviticus, God is continually calling us to draw near to Him. So that, as we draw to Him, He will draw near to us and change us, hallelujah. So you see, we have to recognize that God likes things in a certain way. And we have to learn to humble ourselves. Now, for example, if you know Matthew 6 is very interesting, interesting. Matthew 6 is something very interesting about communing with God. And which is, let's read please. Because see, in the day and age we live, we have learned to do many things at the same time. You know, I remember even when I, when I, when I was uh, studying for a board exam, for example, I would study the whole night and uh, I would have music on. And I did, I, I kind of enjoyed it and I did very well, you know. So we've learned to do things with a lot of noise, constantly. Very in the visible sphere. But you see, God begins to challenge our paradigms of our culture, yes? The culture of the time. So what is God saying here? In Matthew 6, one of the things that he is saying is that he says, for example, he says, you know, so he's talking about the Pharisees, how they love to pray in the public and uh, get attention and compliments, what religious, godly people they are, you see. And if you look at uh, Matthew 6 verse 5, it says, he says, God says, when you pray, uh, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they are seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you pray, what you, what you should do when you commune with God? You should drive your car and pray. That's the private time for a lot of people today. When I drive to work, I will pray. Yeah, I'll listen to a song, I'll listen to some teaching. But it says, there is a value for that, but that is not the substitute for meeting him alone in private. It says, but when you pray, go into your inner, inner room, close your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So that means God likes things to be done a certain way and he thinks going to help you. See, when you drive and you listen to a teaching, you still can't focus 100% on that. Because if you do, you'll, you can hit your car. <laughs> because when you're driving, you should idly focus on your driving. Especially in India, where people come from anywhere. <laughs> yes, how much we need to focus when we drive. So, it doesn't matter how much we fool ourselves, our, when we are listening to a sermon and we are driving, or listening to a song we are driving, you're not giving 100% attention on God. We can fool ourselves into thinking, I am. No, you're not. In the metro, listening to a podcast is not still the same thing. These are all helpful things, but they never take the place of you meeting God in private. 
and you pouring unto your God heart to and private. Yes. And he said, I'll even reward you if you come to me privately, secretly, and come in with me. So we need to have effective private times with God. And one key for effective private times is you need and I need to learn to meet him alone. There should be a time where no one is allowed to intrude on that time. I try to give a lot of access to my children, you know. And even when I'm, for example, I am uh, counseling people, mentoring people online or in person. I have allowed my children, they can knock my door if they need to talk to me. But there is a time when they cannot do it, which is when I will have my private time with God. Yes. And so the first thing I want to establish is God has ways, He is wise. And you cannot focus 100% in communion with God when you are in the public sphere. You need to find time to be alone. And I've heard so many believers say to me that the day I have spent time morning alone with God, my day has gone out great. Have you ever <laughs> had that experience? Hello? I've heard so many believers say this to me. But then why is not, why aren't you making it a consistent practice? Yes. Why are we happy that once in a week I have done it and it's fun. We have learned to discipline ourselves for so many things, right? I believe that this is a discipline we can inculcate by the grace of God. And what what is interesting in the kingdom of God is you get hungry by eating. When you eat normal food, when you eat, you can eat more after something, right? But in the kingdom of God, it's different. You get hungry by eating. The more you eat the word, the more hungry you become for the word. Hallelujah. So, so one of the things I want to encourage you, pressure ones, is don't know how busy you are. Before you leave for work, please take out at least one hour in the morning or if you can't, one hour at least 45 minutes where you meet him alone. Okay. And sing to him. You can read a scripture portion. You can pray over that scripture portion. And another very important thing to do before you leave, leave your room for your office. Give to God all your meetings of the day. Give to God all the concerns of the day. Yeah. It really makes a difference when you have sought his intervention early in the morning. You know, there's a, there is a verse for it. Yeah. Where God encourages to do something like this. So, if you look at Psalm 5, so Psalm 5, it, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, first three verses. It says, Give Psalm 5, are we there, uh, Suresh? Okay. Psalm 5, verse 1 onwards. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. He the sounds of my cry for help, my King and my God, for I, for to you I pray. Now look at verse 3, that's the focus verse. In the morning, O Lord, you'll hear my voice. Does it say in the afternoon you'll hear my voice? In the night you'll hear my voice? Only when I'm in trouble you'll hear my voice? Is it saying man? Oh, only when I'm sick, God, you'll hear my voice. What's he saying? He, the psalmist is the habit of every morning communing with God. And he says, in the morning, Lord, you'll hear my voice. Yeah. In the morning, O oh Lord, you'll hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. Hallelujah. In the morning, I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch with expectation what you will do. In the original language, the sense is, I will shoot an arrow to you. I'll shoot my prayers as arrows towards you, one after the other. And I will then expect you to do something because I've shot arrows in the morning too. Hallelujah. That you are going to move your mighty arm and favor me. And I will see your blessing and all that I have spoken to you about. Hallelujah. Please, special ones, let's do this. When you sp take your time in the morning, get up a little more early than you do. Yeah. Spend that 45 minutes one in the morning alone with God and sing to Him, read the scripture portion, pray the scripture portion, and then spend some time giving to Him the concerns of the day, the meetings you have. Trust me, God is interested in your meetings. <laughs> God is very interested in all that we do. See, it's like saying, you know, what kind of a dad I am if I am only concerned about the studies of my children. I am not really a good dad then, am I? Imagine Akshat comes all excited and says, Dad, I have a football match, will you come and see? And I say, what football? You love football, get out. <laughs> do we do that to our kids? We are excited about everything they are involved in, yes? 
because my child is not doing something sometimes i am i am willing to endure the most boring thing also yes god loves you and me we are his children the bible says that through faith in jesus we have become the children of god everything you are involved with it matters to god your office meetings matter to god your work matters to god your relationships matter to god everything you are involved in it matters to him. hallelujah so don't you think it will be good if in the morning we can invoke his hand of blessing his hand of favor and all that we are doing the whole day so if you know you are going to have a difficult presentation difficult meeting why aren't we talking to god about in the morning and saying lord i'm expecting hand of favor today yes you know you're going to meet a difficult cousin in the evening at home <laughs> pray Lord, I am expecting reconciliation, or I am expecting you bring some healing in that meeting with my relative. Yes. Perhaps you are going for a RWA meeting. You have got some bright ideas. Pray. How about we not just do it in the last minute? How about we do it in the morning, and we say, Lord, I am expecting your hand of favor on all that I am doing today, and list out certain things to me. Your presentations matter to God. Those difficult meetings in the office matter to God. And the higher you rise in the ranks, the more tricky many other many of the meetings become. Yes. How much we need His wisdom? How much we need His favor? How much we need His blessing? And on what we are doing. Hallelujah. I have found. Anything you're doing, if you humble yourself and God blesses it, you begin to do better in it. Anything. So we were even if you know, so we were sending both our kids to for football coaching, and I felt Weber was making good progress. Akshay wasn't making such a good progress. So then I began to pray about it to God. I said, Lord, give my son the unusual grace to play football well. He loves the game. He needs to play it well. You need to give him the unusual grace to play this game well. Give him the mental aspect he needs. The mental toughness he needs. Give him help. Give him favor of the coach. And I began to see the more I prayed, the more I saw Kabu Akshat has improved drastically in football. So what I have more and more realized is, doesn't matter what you're doing, if you humble and ask God, invoke God's hand of favor and blessing, something changes. A supernatural element comes on what you're doing. Hallelujah. So use this, please. You know, in the morning, like the psalm is, let's shoot our To do list to God, all all the tricky things in office, all the other things you need to do the whole day, shoot it to the Lord, and say, Lord, I am expecting you will do something now, because I have humbled myself and I have asked you to bless this. Hallelujah. Okay, so so when we have a private time, let's please fix a time. It's good to have a fixed time when you are praying. Okay, that always helps. Have a fixed time when you are going to bring the morning. Have a fixed time when you have a family altar. Please, it helps. We are creatures of habit. It always helps us to form habits. Like you can form bad habits, you can form good habits. Also, it helps if you can have a personal time. If you can have your room fixed. Okay, this is the room I will pray. It helps to have to fix a room, to fix your time. We are creatures of habit. It helps us. Okay. Also, when you go, and it's good to always start with Thanksgiving. Yes, Thanksgiving is always very powerful. We start with Thanksgiving for what God has already done for us. Yes, it's there's so much to thank God for constant, isn't it? Thank God for life. Thank God for the house. Thank God for the wife. Thank God for the kids. Thank God for the church. Thank God for the job. There's just so much to thank God for. Thank God for good health. You know, when you fall sick, that's when you realize, "Arey, yar, good health is such a blessing." Have you noticed? You know, when we have our cell groups, you know, so now Sandeep is not able to come because of his uh, sh- uh, the shifts he has. But earlier when he would come, one testimony Sandeep will always says, "Prabhu ne samhal ke rakha." You know, now that looks like har baar yar, tu ye line bolta hai. बट इसी उस लाइन में बात है बिकॉज वो कह के रहा है इट्स बिकॉज ऑफ द लॉर्ड आई एम डूइंग वेल माई हेल्थ इज वेल आई एम मेंटली फिजिकली मोस्टली डूइंग वेल सो आई थिंक दैट्स वेरी गुड एक्नोलेजमेंट 
कि प्रभु ने संभाल कर रखा गॉड हैज बिन टेकिंग केयर ऑफ सो स्टार्ट विद थैंक्स गिविंग इट्स वेरी पावरफुल थैंक यू फॉर वट एपन यस्टरडे थैंक यू वट एपन द होल वीक थैंक यू फॉर जस्ट द अबंडस ऑफ द थिंग्स गॉड डज फॉर अस लुक एट सम एक्सप्रेशन दैट द साम इज से He says things like God has brought me to a broad place. Yeah. He says God has dealt bountifully with me. How amazing is that? So thanksgiving is a very powerful thing to do when you start. We again have a Bible verse for it. I'll enter his gates with, with, complain. <laughs> I'll enter his gates with complain and cribbing. Ah, I'll enter his gates with thanks, and I'll enter his courts with. Shouting, screaming, <laughs> with praise. I'll, en- I'll enter his gates with thanks and his courts with praise. God has laid it down for us. How He likes being approached. How He wants us to worship. See, the foundational attitude to grow in God is not sincerity, even more than humility. So you can be sincere and humble. Have you, you know, we can be sincere and not humble, and miss out on going in God. Humility is the most foundational aspect. So, after we meet with the Lord Jesus, we really need to humble ourselves and do a lot of unlearning, and say, "Okay, Lord, I want to learn what you like. Put aside what I want." So we come to God with thanksgiving. We enter His gates with thanks and His courts with praise. Oh. Also good after that when you have when you have thanked him you have praised him it's good to before you get into the word it's good to also just commit with thanksgiving your anxieties and worries to God because otherwise you won't be able to focus on what you're reading even right now if you have come to this service and you have not dealt with anxieties and worries and things troubling you you will struggle to grasp what I'm saying because you're so distracted with those things. But if you have come before you came here, if you with thanksgiving you gave it to the Lord, you rolled your anxieties and worries to the Lord and came, then God gave you peace, and then you can sit here peacefully, internally be at rest, and you can listen to the word and benefit. Yes. So another thing that has helped me a lot is you start with you enter his gates with thanks, you enter his courts with praise, and then you take some time with thanksgiving to give your anxieties and concerns and fears already there. You give it to the Lord. Yes. And then you find when you we have read the sermon in Philippians that don't be anxious for anything, but with thanksgiving make your request known to God. And then we are also told that God also roll, will give something to us. What does He give to us? See, when we roll our concerns and worries to God, He also rolls something back to us. What is that? Peace that surpasses all understanding. And then you can walk out of that room. Your problems aren't sorted, but you are put to rest by God. And then you can focus, and you can. Part like a wisdom, and you can do things. Hallelujah. So after you have given your concerns to God and with thanks, when you have received His peace, that's a good time then to start reading your Bible. Because otherwise, when you read your Bible, you're not you're always so distracted. You won't hear His voice. Have you read the Bible where your mind is all over the place? Hello. And then we are making a to do list also on the side. Geezer, ठीक कराना है. वो ईमेल करना है खतरनाक एंड वेन यू रीड द वर्ड रीड इट ऑडियोबली प्लीज लॉर्ड ऑफ यूल हैबिट ऑफ रीडिंग इन देयर माइंड रीड द बाइबल ऑडियोबली बिकॉज फेथ कम्स बाय हियरिंग हियरिंग द वर्ड ऑफ गॉड वेन आई एम रीडिंग इट फॉर यू इट्स हेल्पिंग यू वेन यू रीड लाउडली ऑल्सो इट हेल्प यू बिकॉज फेथ कम्स बाय Hearing and hearing the word of God. Learn to read it audibly. Learn to read audibly. Okay. So read your Bible slowly. Read it audibly. And call on the Lord to open your eyes. Call on the Lord to speak to you. Even right now, before I start preaching, what did I say? I said, Lord, open our eyes to see wonderful things from Your Word. There are promises that God has given. Where he says, "If you pray, I will give you the eye, and I'll give you the ear." Yes. So, so many promises are there. 
Jeremiah, in Jeremiah we see this, right? Call on me and I'll show you great and unsearchable things you do not know. So before you open your Bible, you say, okay, Lord, show me great and unsearchable things I do not know. Grant me understanding. We see how when the disciples were on the road to Amos and Jesus after the resurrection appeared to them, it says that the Lord granted them understanding. So they were able to grasp what Jesus was saying. Yes? We can say, simply like a child, we can say, Lord, grant me understanding today when I read this Bible. Yes? You know, this is the only book when you read, the author shows up himself. Hallelujah. The only book, this is the only book where if you read it prayerfully, the author himself shows up and starts talking to you. How amazing is that? So, study the word with an attitude of humility where even before you start reading, you are asking God and saying, Lord, give me understanding. Lord, open my eyes to see wonderful things from your word. Yeah. So, you are humbling yourself. You are reading with the attitude of humility. As you are, and it's also good to do it in two ways. One is to have a macro reading of the Bible, where every year you set your heart to read from Genesis to Revelation. Okay, that's called the macro reading of the Bible, where you study from Genesis to Revelation. There are a lot of good Bible reading plans that you can use. And you can do macro reading, which is from Genesis to Revelation. It's a fixed portion of scripture, they normally it's one or two chapters. So that's one way. So one is the macro reading you're doing. Another way to do it also is that you can take one particular book and focus on it. For example, in the times we live, certain very relevant books are 1 Peter, Daniel. They're very relevant books. Ephesians, Colossians. You can also take up a book based on the season of life you're going through. Yeah. You can take a book based on the seasonal life you are going through. So, for example, if you are going through a lot of um, hostility at work, a good book to take is Nehemiah. Because in Nehemiah, we see he faced a lot of hostility and how did it with hostility. You are facing, for example, um, um, if you look at, if you are, if you are finding that in many, in, in certain very key areas of your life, you are finding your hope is being postponed, for example, as per your mindset. Good to read Genesis. You meet with people who learn to wait on God. Yes. So, the couple of ways we can decide that I will do micro reading of this book and macro reading is easy. You can just take a plan and through the year you can read one or two chapters a day. So, that's the reading. Okay. So, there's something called reading and there's something called study. There's a difference between the two, right? So, it's good to have a macro reading of the Bible where you just read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation the whole year. And then there is something called you study the Bible where you can take a, one particular book of the Bible and you read it thoroughly. You take up one chapter a day. Okay. And these books, it helps if you can take them as per the relevant seasons, what's happening in the country. For example, I think Daniel is a great book right now to work with, what's happening in the nation. Yeah, 1 Peter is a great book with all the persecution. And uh, as I also said, your personal season of life. What is your personal season of life that you're going through? It definitely, see when you read something that is helping you to fight better in your own season also, you're very awake and alive to receiving from God. Yes. So, when we were not having children, me and Vasu, we studied together a lot Abraham's life from Genesis. Because Abraham and Sarah were not having children by. So, we said, let's learn from these fellows what they did, how they, what are the lessons they learned, what can we learn from them. And also, they give us encouragement, right? Because the child is not going to be Isaac is So, you see, you also encouragement that if God did it for, Abraham will do it for. Me. If God did for Nehemiah, he had so much of hostility against him. This guy still did so well. What does it do? It gives you hope, right? So, also another very interesting thing that can help you to select your book and be, what are the questions the Holy Spirit is raising in your heart? Yeah. See, the Holy Spirit is often raising questions in our heart. You can also start reading, reading choose, a, choose a book to work with, depending upon the question the Holy Spirit is raising in your heart. 
and sometimes you might have the question and not able to figure out go come talk to us we will help you you tell us your question and we will help you this is the bible uh, book you can read to deal with that question yes for example you so, you know people in your family could be very sick all the time and you want to you you really sense say i want to learn how does one walk in health that is in the lord yeah there is question god can raise up you are doing everything you know to do but you are not prospering financially yeah there can be question okay are how does one grow in wise stewardship of money because this area i am not doing well it can be how do i excel at work i am not doing well what can i learn from the bible now i see it's very interesting that in hebrews 12 we told we get a very important insight that helps us in our spiritual growth yeah let me just take you there hebrew hebrews 12 So this comes after all the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11 yeah and there's a very important key to help us grow in Hebrews 12 couple the first couple of verses itself so so Hebrews 11 is about the heroes of faith and just after talking a lot of heroes of faith this is what hebrews to starts off with therefore when other therefore we ask what came before so what came before was god is to talk to us about the heroes of faith so therefore since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us we have so many heroes of faith surrounding us cheering for us and let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race set before us fixing our eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of faith fixing eyes on jesus interesting right how do you fix your eyes on jesus you fix your eyes on jesus by two ways as per this bible verse you fix your eyes on jesus by fixing eyes on the character of christ revealed in scripture the finished work of the cross you also fix your eyes on jesus when you commune with god over a witness in the bible that is relevant for you right now There's not what you're going through. Someone in this Bible has gone through something similar and broken through. Hello. There's not what you're going through right now. There's some in this Bible went through something similar and broke through. So you also can fix your eyes on Jesus by communing with God over the life of this witness and learn how the Lord faithfully dealt with this person, the lesson God taught this person, and you can glean and grasp those lessons and apply in your own life and see similar results. Hallelujah. So you fix your eyes on Jesus one by fixing eyes on the character of Jesus the cross the work of the cross in the words of Jesus you also fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus when you fix your eyes and come in God over a witness in this bible who went through something very similar to what you are going through and he broke through some very relevant for your season right now Sometimes I have found David has been someone extremely helpful to me in a particular season of life. Sometimes been a Joseph, sometimes been a Daniel, sometimes been a Nehemiah, sometimes been an Abraham, and sometimes Moses has been extremely useful. If no one is listening to you, read Moses, right? Poor fellow. Koi sun nahi raha hai. Sab kuch complain kar rahe hain. Everybody is so. If you, if you, if in your team nobody is listening to you, everybody is keeping complaining against you. Moses is a good guy to read. No one listened to him also. In fact, they got under his skin, didn't they? <laughs> so much cribbing and complaining the people did under his authority. They got under his skin, and he struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. He allowed the, these complainers and violers to get under his skin. Yes. so if you are a person who is find a lot of revolt in your team moses is the good guy for you to work with you can learn many things from moses yes so think about it so what so i would encourage you in your private times you can alternate by as one day you can have a macro reading the next day perhaps you can have a study of a particular book and you faithfully work and when you do a study you just deal with one chapter 
right so macro reading you can read two chapters also right and and so as per the season the nation is going through as per season that what um, you are going through as uh, it could your reading can be affected by the questions that the holy spirit is in your heart for example you know uh, i i remember one once a guy said to me he said uh he said i spend most of my life at work and uh he said um uh, how does my studying the bible help me because he thought this bible will only help him with the redemptive mandate of god i said hey this bible talks about a creative mandate is it relevant and even in your office you can always further the redemptive mandate by how you do the creative mandate also when people see the excellence the creativity with which you do the creative mandate on your life it opens a lot of opportunities for redemptive mandate to flourish because people don't ask you bhaiya tu aisa kaisa hai and then you can tell about christ hallelujah so so sometimes questions even people have put up to me have pushed me to study and read the word to find answers what do you say to someone like this you know who says i don't see any point of reading the bible any point of studying the bible i spend all my time in work only and i said this bible has a lot to say about your work glory thank god through your work yes and i believe that god will teach you amazing lessons at work which he will use every because our life is a whole it's not it's not uh, you know our lives we make them into compartments but it's not into compartments right the lessons you learn at work so much they can be used in the ministry they can so much be used in just anything you do isn't it so there are so many questions we can have in their mind you know and the questions should also direct your bible study study not just reading of the bible yeah okay so in the time that you have a lot in the morning you can alternate between macro reading of the whole bible once year and micro reading where you take up a book and you read take one chapter now when you take that one chapter it's good to ask some questions and i would encourage all of you to please have a study bible okay it's important to have a study bible because uh, there is a b c of bible study is very important what is a accurate information b is background c is common sense yeah but we need a good bible a good uh, study bible for the b which is the background the historical background the cultural background we can understand who wrote this book to whom it was written why was it written what was the writer trying to accomplish and what was the background that and the political background the economic background the cultural background and a good study bible will give you all these details and help to grasp better what you read yes please i encourage you have use not just a normal bible this just a normal bible if you want to read this is fine but if you want to study the bible good to have a study bible invest money on in that it will give you a lot of the b it give a lot of the b which is the background you need it you need that right so a is accurate information b is background c is common sense and the b is extremely important which you and i need help from bible scholars okay is if you really want to understand well what was being said you need to understand in the original setting who was the original speakers who the original audience what was being said what were they trying to sort out so then you can more effectively apply it to your times we can apply it to our times and our setting in our context yes and ask questions like again i'll repeat please use the study bible and ask question like who is written this book why it has been written who is the audience to whom it has been written what is the writer trying to achieve kyu likha bhai w h y why 
I remember um, <laughs> some time back talking to a friend of mine and saying, hey, you know, you sh- why don't you write blogs? He said, there are so many blogs out there. Who will listen, read my blogs here? <laughs> Interesting, right? You know, I tweet not for people, I tweet for myself. I tweet for myself. When I tweet, it, you know, and I write quotes, it, it helps refine my own thoughts, the things I'm learning. Easily I can grab a hold of it. There is a place where I can easily grab a hold of it. And maybe it'll, it might encourage somebody. But I don't tweet for anybody, I tweet for myself. But what's the point I'm making? It's important for us to gain our own voice by study. And then we can effectively help a lot of people eventually. Right? So, who is the author? To whom it is this book is being written? Who are the written audience? Why this person has written it? What would what was the outcome? What was the background that time? Who were the political rulers of the time? What was the cultural background at the time? What the economic background? It immensely helps us and you need a study Bible. Yeah. When you're reading, a couple of things we should always be looking for when you're reading. And uh, even when, when I end the sermon, I always ask you to respond with, in three ways. It's also very useful. You can use it when, you, when you're studying a chapter. For example, what am I learning as I'm reading about the character of God and the ways of God in this chapter? You can note it. Yeah. Number one, what am I? As you read the chapter, one thing to look for is as reading a chapter is, What is this chapter saying about the character of God and the ways of God? Write it on the side. Second, this Bible is a mirror also, right? Shows you what is not right with you. So when you read the chapter, another good thing we look for is, where is and how is God convicting me as I am reading, as I am seeing this mirror? God wants to convict us, right? So, So, for example, you read, when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. When you are generous to the poor, Prabhupada says, you are lending to the Lord. And it convicts you that, yeah, I was, I am not generous to poor people. Yeah. So, you note it down and you start and you repent and you say, Lord, I am sorry. I realized as I was reading, the mirror of the word showed me that, yes, I am not being generous with poor people. Cleanse me, wash me and... Enlarge my heart, help me, give me great idea how to be generous with people. Yeah? So, this word is a mirror also. You read this word, in two ways it's a mirror. One, it shows you what is not right with you. Yes? Second, it also shows you how the new glorious new creatures looks. It also shows you that, right? So, you can also be awakened to who you have become because you are in Christ. Okay. So, in two ways, it's a mirror. One, it shows you things not right with you. It also shows you the new glorious creature you have become, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. So, second thing when you are when you are studying is to make a note of where you have been convicted and you put it, put it right on the side. We need to deal with this now with God, right? Third thing when you read any chapter, you should be asking yourself this question. How am I going to apply this in my own unique context? Because God doesn't just want us to be scholars. He wants us to be people who are living out the word. Yes? He wants us to be living out this word. He wants this word to transform our behavior. Hindi is very good. You have to be able to change your mind from your mind. It says, Hallelujah. Very interesting, right? In Romans 12, Hindi mein likha hai, Tumhare man ke nai hone se, Tumhara chal chalan badal jayega. So, is God just interested in intellectually you being stimulated in your mind? Hello? No. He is, in, he is interested that what you are reading should eventually affect your lifestyle. It should affect the way you take decisions. It should affect your impact for God. Hallelujah. 
So a third thing that you should writing down on the side when you are studying a chapter is what are one or two things I will do differently or pray differently or in other words because I read this chapter or how will I apply the learnings from the chapter to my unique context and setting. And we also do it every time when I preach. I always make sure I say these things to the end of my preaching. Ke bhaiya, ye teen ke mein socho. Yes. So you write right. And, and, and once you finish that chapter, you start talking to God on this issue. So first you start thanking God. Thank you, Father, for showing me light in this chapter. This is the light you've shown me. And you start talking to God. Okay, this is what you showed me today. Let's read this chapter. I saw that you're sovereign. I was reminded that you're sovereign. Hallelujah. Correction could be perhaps. Lord, forgive me. I get scared very quickly by unpleasant things happening in my life. And so I recognize today that I need an enlarged, I need my view enlarged that you are sovereign. So Lord, awaken me to see that you are the sovereign one, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so I have nothing to fear. Perhaps could be the prayer, right? How do you apply it? Think of how you are going to apply it. What is one or two things you will do differently or pray differently? Last time I gave you a hint when I was preaching uh, about what, how you could apply my last Sunday sermon preaching, for example, where I talked about Elisha praying for his servant, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Right? Abhi, ab bhaiya, humare ko to marne aaye nahi hai. So what do you pray? How do you apply that story to your own life? I said, you can use the prayers of Apostle Paul in Ephesians, Colossians, where he is saying, Open the eyes of their heart to see this, 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 this. Yes. So, I, what I was doing? I was helping you to see this story, how you can easily apply it in your own life. Read the word so that you are able to more and more see from God's eyes. And I was also giving ready-made prayers that you can use. That Apostle Paul has prayed. Basically, Elisha was saying, open his spiritual eyes, right? And what is Paul praying in Ephesians 1? Open their inner eyes, their spiritual eyes to see. And to see what? He's giving a list. He gave a list, right? What is the list? For example, in Ephesians. What is open their eyes to see the hope of their calling? Open their eyes to see the, rich, the riches of inheritance in Christ. And third was, open their eyes to see the power that they use from the dead is at work in them. In us, yes? So, how do you apply? Now I'll give you another classic classic story where after I read it, I was like, Lord, how do you apply this? Okay, now the story is this. Um, the king of Israel has gone, the king of Judah has gone with the king of Israel to war against a particular army and uh, they have got stuck in the wilderness. They've got stuck in the desert and they're saying, we will die of thirst only here. Forget about going in fighting the war. So the king of Judah says, why? We need a prophetic word here. So a prophet is brought, Elisha is brought. And Elisha says, gives them the word. He says, there will be no wind, there will be no rain. Dig ditches here in this desert. Dig ditches in the desert. There will be no wind, there will be no rain. But the desert, the ditches are full of water. Very interesting, right? So two kings are stuck. They are going to fight an enemy king together. On the way, they get stuck in a desert. They have no water to drink also. So they are thinking, forget about winning a war, we won't die of thirst. Then they get a prophetic fellow. Okay, bhaiya, kuch to batao. So the fellow, prophetic man, Elisha, what does he say? He says, dig ditches here. Now who will dig ditches in the desert and why? And then look at the prophet, prophetic word. Dig ditches, there will be no wind, there will be no rain, but the ditches will be full of water. So I'm reading this and saying, Are Prabhu, where do I go and dig a ditch here now? Main kaan pe ja ke khodu? Yes. How to apply this story in my life? And so God said to me, they had to put their faith and do a faith act. They had to put confidence in the word the Prophet brought. So, in other words, digging the ditches is nothing but a faith act. Putting confidence in the wisdom that I sent. So God said to me, if you want to dig ditches in a life, it simply means yielding to radical acts of obedience, radical acts of faith. Those are the ditches that you dig. 
and then there will be no wind, there will be no rain, but it is full of water. Hallelujah. So we need to be asking the question, I am reading the question, how do I apply it? So I asked God, I said, Lord, where do I do dig ditches here? How will you have to dig ditches? God says you have to dig spiritual ditches. What are the spiritual ditches? Acts of faith. Why would any sensible person dig ditches in a desert, you tell me? There is never rain in the desert. It never rains in the desert. Why should any sensible person dig a ditch, dig many ditches there? Why do you have to dig a ditch in the desert? But they did it. Why? Because they believed God sent a word to the prophet. It was a faith act. It was an act of faith. Hallelujah. So when you are in a desert situation, you need to ask God, what is the ditch that I need to dig? What is, what is the spiritual ditches I need to dig for water to come now? Hallelujah. Yes? You know, whenever I find our personal finances struggling, we will give to some servants of God money. Because those are my ditches that I am digging at that time. And we'll ask God, okay Lord, which man of God do you want us to give money to? And when we give that money, we find something will always happen. Some breakthroughs always come financially. But those, those, are, those are ditches we are digging by faith. And then there is no wind, there is no rain, but the ditches are full of water. In the story also it says, no rain came, no wind came. It says from a particular distance, supernaturally water came. Hallelujah. It filled the ditches. How awesome is that? So, reading a story is not enough. We need to find out how to apply it in my unique context and setting. So the story of the ditches immensely helped me. Because when I was reading it, I was having financial challenges. And I said, Lord, how do I apply this? He said, okay, some acts of faith you need to do. And, and in this desert, I will send water to you. But first, you dig some ditches here. Do some acts of faith. And God spoke to me to send money to two men of God. And isn't it interesting, you are struggling financially and God is asking you to send money to more two or two people. You are like, Prabhu, how does it make sense? That's an act of faith, right? Your finances are doing well and God is inspiring some money to others and you are putting your faith in what God is saying to you. It's an act of faith. And we send money to those, those two servants of God. And God just miraculously opened up just so much for us. And when he started opening up those things, he said to me, you dug the ditches, I filled them with water. The water doesn't come if you don't dig ditches. You need to dig ditches for water to come. Supernaturally. What are we doing? Prabhu, pani bej, pani bej, pani bej. Prabhu, what are we saying? Dig ditches, dig ditches, dig ditches. Digging ditches costs. You have to do act of faith. It's an act of faith. Imagine the king telling the army, "Is Banjar Bhumi me in this desert? Gadde khod do bhai. Do you know what they'll say? Mad, pagal aadmi. A camp has gone. Yeah, mad king we are. That's what they will say to the guy. So he's putting his reputation on the line, isn't he? He's putting his reputation on the line, saying, "I'm not mad. You do this." And you do it, and then God fulfills His part. Yes, but what, but what's the point I'm making? Precious ones, when you read uh, a book, a chapter in a book, and you want to, you need to ask the question: How do I apply what I'm reading to my unique context and setting? Because see, if Jesus died on the cross to make us Bible scholars, then He died needlessly, right? It's too big a price to pay, right? He died on the cross to make us like himself. Yes? So, when you're studying your Bible, the third question, the third very important question always is, how do I apply what I'm reading to my own unique context and setting? Yeah? So, when you finished 
you you got your three you got your three points you need to work on the three points thank you father for showing me from this chapter was reading these things about your character and about your ways you've written down how god convicted you thank you father for convicting me and showing me that this is something that i have not been doing properly perhaps today god might convict some of you about not having a healthy private time a consistent private time with god so when we talk to god about what is convicting us off sometimes you read proverbs you get convicted to many things proverbs talks a lot about a lot of human behavior issues right so second thing is you you confess what do you do when you recognize that you are not matching up with what you are reading the mirror is showing you something not right the bible says in 1 john that you can conf- if you confess your sin god is faithful and righteous to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness one sorry from the heart is precious i also encourage you this it's not just enough to say sorry it's also important to to confess god's perspective on the issue true confession should be twofold it should not just be about the sorry it's also about okay god what are your thoughts on the issue i will also confess that so for example you were reading and and you're reading about the unmerciful servant he was forgiven by the king but he is not forgiving somebody right the king forgave him a very large amount of money but when he found someone who owed him small amount of money he caught him and got him thrown in the jail so you reading for example this and god convicts you that you are not a forgiving person then you to forgive right so it's not just about okay lord help me to forgive this person from that it's also about reminding yourself what are god's thoughts on the issue which is lord you have richly forgiven me in christ you have unconditionally forgiven me in christ you have given forgiveness through the cross that i don't deserve you have lavished forgiveness on me so help me also not to lavish forgiveness on people help me lord jesus to not return evil for evil in surface but give a blessing that i may inherit a blessing help me to come to a point where i can truly bless the person have you ever, have, have you have you found any time difficult to bless people who hurt you or for easy suresh i come and slap you right now can you bless me tomorrow see suresh is a nice guy he will say chhod de yaar isko main nahi marunga isko but you know that's not enough you know you know generally what we do when we have issues with people we don't want to see their face again right but that's not forgiveness right forgiveness also includes every time the devil reminds you of those people you are able to bless them and and believe god is going to bless them you know i've said this before in one of my sermons that when i didn't know the power of my blessing i would easily bless people who hurt me when i began to see yaar if i bless they are blessed indeed i said yaar ye to main to nahi karunga yaar pehle to tang karta upar se i have to bless them and he will prosper also why yaar it's just too much so you see when i didn't know the power of the blessing of believer i would bless easily people hurt me i tell god bless you but when i began to realize hey when a child would actually bless somebody they actually blessed I was like, "Prabhu, this is a very difficult job." One of these fellows has been mean. I have forgiven him. I am not taking revenge. Isn't that enough? Now you want me to bless him, and he'll prosper also. Is it too much? And then God said, "But haven't I lavished on you this kind of forgiveness and blessing? Hallelujah!" And that's when you have to answer before Jesus. Yes. Hello. You know, every time I went with the complaint to Jesus, now He'll always put it back on. But I've done this for you, now. And then you're speechless because you're yes, 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 you did it. So then, what do we do? We humble ourselves and say, Lord, I need help. I am struggling to bless this person. Cleanse my heart. Help me. I want to bless this person also. Let this fellow and his children do well. Yes. Sometimes it's not easy, right? We have a struggle. But you see, you can't fight with God because you go to Him and He says, "Look at the cross. Look at how I have lavished things on you. And now I am only asking you to do what I have already done for you." You know what the most beautiful thing about God? He will first lavish something on us and then say, "Now you do likewise." Hallelujah. See, that's there's a very big difference between many of the corporate sector bosses and God. Many of the corporate sector boss, He will not tell you what to do. He will say, "You figure out." Go. Hello. Anyone got a boss like that ever? They know, still they don't tell you. Go figure out. 
but god is not like that but god is an amazing person he first he will lavish on us precious graces and he will say i have lavished abundantly this grace on you now go why don't you do like what is what god does always says hallelujah first god has really forgiven us so then he says go forgive people hallelujah god richly blesses us and he says go other bless others yes he unconditionally loves us that's why he has the audacity to say to us go love unconditionally bhai god is the initiator and he expects to keep responding god is the one who keeps initiating salvation for us and he wants us to keep responding to what is lavishing on us hallelujah so so when you reading uh, you are studying sorry the word when you are studying that one chapter in that book that you are convinced you want to work with and before you finish in prayer in communion with god three things you do you thank god for light words scattered ways you ask for forgiveness so you can meet with the holy spirit and third you ask god for wisdom how do i apply what i learned in this chapter to my unique setting and context yes okay good be willing to confess with your mouth the new revelation the holy spirit is opening your eyes to see when you were reading ask god's grace that you can act on what you have been meditating on as i close let me just quickly share with you the process of receiving revelation so first of all if you want to receive illumination from god or god to in a man with the light of scripture first is very important to accurate information first you need to have accurate information right second you need to as you are prayerfully working with the accurate information you will find god will give you illumination can we read isaiah 820 please he will give illumination to your inner man isaiah 820 isaiah what did it say Isaiah 8:20 says to the law and the testimony if they do not speak according to your word it is because they have no dawn something very powerful is being spoken here god is saying if people are not living the life as per my word it is because they have no dawning in the inner person they have no illumination the inner person there is no dawning that how powerful and amazing this is hallelujah so when you prayerfully work with accurate information the study bible will give you a lot of accurate information right when you prayerfully work with the study bible that chapter accurate information prayerfully holy spirit will bring illumination to your inner person right and we just saw dawning will be released to you and then you will find inspiration hallelujah you'll find a divine inspiration and so 2 timothy 3 16 17 2 2 timothy 3 16 and 17 all scripture is inspired by god all scripture is inspired by god and is profitable for teaching reproof correction and training righteousness so the man of god the woman of god may be adequate equipped for every good work so you find that illumination begins to give inspiration to you and there is new revelation that you receive romans 76 romans 76 maybe we can read five onwards uh, romans 6 five onwards for while we were in the flesh the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death but now we have been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter so as you work with prayerfully accurate information what we find is that god begins to illuminate your man he begins to give inspiration and you find new revelation is coming to you you know that god has lifted the veil what does revelation mean it's not the light was on there earlier for you god has not lifted the veil and you're able to see what you couldn't see revelation has to do with god lifting the veil from your eyes so you can see what you couldn't see earlier the light that was there yeah 
And when you have a new revelation, there is going to be a realization. Yeah, it, it, there is going to be a realization. Your inner man is going to be completely convinced, yes, this is how it is. And then there will be a transformation. It, you find you have been transformed and there will be a manifestation. When you are being transformed, it will manifest. Yes, hallelujah. It's like what Pastor Laji was saying to us when, when a man met with in UP, when he was talking about a man meeting with Jesus and growing in Jesus, when he stopped beating his wife. The wife said, what happened to you? Why are you not beating me anymore? Right? What is that? It's a manifestation that something has changed in this man. Yes? But it all starts with what? The manifestation is the last step, right? It starts with what? Your willingness to prayerfully work with accurate information using a Bible, a study Bible. That's where it starts. And eventually it will become, it will manifest as a change in you. A change in the person, your character, your lifestyle. Hallelujah. So for realization, we can read Hebrews 6, 11. So once there is a new revelation, your whole being is convinced and you realize, hey, this is really the truth. This for me is now reality for me. Hallelujah. You realize. Hebrews 6, 11, what does it say? Hebrews. I'm just going to close now. So Hebrews 6, 11. Hebrews 6, 11 And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. God wants us to realize many things. For example, He wants to realize things like full assurance of our hope in God. Okay, transformation. After realization will come transformation. After transformation will come manifestation. If you have been transformed internally, it will manifest in your actions. Yes, and behavior and character. So, transformation, 2 Corinthians 3.18, 2 Corinthians 3.18, okay. So, maybe we can read from verse 13. We are not like Moses, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.13. Uh, we are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so the sons of Israel could not look intently. At the end of that was fading away, but their minds were hardened for until the very day of the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. But to this day, when a Moses is read, a veil lies over the heart, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled faces are beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So the more you behold God from the Word, the more you are being changed by the glory of God as you are perceiving it from the Word of God. Yeah. How are we transformed? We are transformed by spending time with this glorious God. We have uh, psychiatrists are telling us and you know, uh, well-renowned world coaches telling us that the five people with whom you spend your time, you become like them. Have you, have you heard that? How much more you spend time with the most glorious one who made the universe? How much you become like him? And in this, what I just read, we are being told this. The more you commune with God and behold his glory, the more you are transformed into that glorious God's character and image. Hallelujah. You know, my mentor, he, he shared with me that he... Um, so, he's a very gentle guy. So one, so, one day I said, hey, how come you're such a gentle guy? And he said, you know, when in my younger days, I was a very angry man. And God has dealt with me over the years. And the more I have spent time with the gentle Jesus, his gentleness has been rubbing off on me and affecting me and transforming me. Hallelujah. That's how we change, right? The more we behold the Lord through the scriptures, the more we find God begins to transform and change us and affect us with His attributes and what is on Him. He puts on us His divine attributes on Him, right? Last is manifestation. If there's a, there's a transformation, it will manifest in actions, changed ways and characters. So 2 Corinthians for 2, manifestation. 2 Corinthians for, maybe we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll read 1 and 2. 2 Corinthians for 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have this, min this ministry, we receive mercy. We do not lose heart, but we are renouncing the things hidden because of the shame, not walking the craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, by the manifestation of truth. Hey, we should be continually manifesting the truth of God's word through our actions and our dealings. Okay, 
But by the manifestation of the truth, we are commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. We should be people who are continually manifesting the truth of God's word through our decisions, through our actions. And that is such an amazing testimony to God's mighty hand at work in our lives. Hallelujah. We should often be people who, people should come and say, Yaar, tu aisa kyu kar rahe? Okay, so let me just close with, with, with one example. Uh, I had, you know, I used to work in sales and marketing. Uh, I am a mechanical engineer. I, I used to work in sales and marketing and so I remember going, going to the distributor in Gwalior and so he said, please extend your stay by one more day. So we did, we had, I had booked my tickets, everything. I was there for two days and he said, please extend to one more day. But I said, hey, I don't have, you know, you want me to cancel a reserve ticket and go. He said, no, no, I will manage it. So, okay, so I cancelled. So then I said one word in Gwalior and then I was getting into the general compartment. Right? So the distributor says, Sir, where are you going? Go to the AC, 100 rupees, 200 rupees, TT, go. It will be done. I said, I can't give 200 rupees. So I have to get into the general compartment. What's going on here? Some manifestation is going on what God has been doing inside me. right? So he was shocked. He was like, I'm crazy. What are you doing? I'll do it. He said, you go and go, I'll give TT, I'll give you 500 rupees, you please go in AC. I said, I can't do it. It's a bit. So I actually traveled from Gawalia to Delhi in a general compartment. After that day, there was a remarkable change in this man's behavior towards me. He became one of the most loyal distributors there, just at one incident. And I didn't enjoy the, I didn't enjoy it all the general compartment. So many times we don't enjoy certain aspects of serving God, but they are very precious and important nevertheless. The, the Lord didn't enjoy the cross. He didn't say enjoyed the cross. He says he endured the cross. Yeah. Sometimes to take steps of righteousness, we endure certain things. But I said, sorry man, I can't do this. And I really couldn't do it, not because of what God had doing inside me. And that one incident affected him a lot. So first he was upset with me, but later he began to respect me. And he was convinced of one thing. Yeah, kuch bhi, ye aadmi galat kaam nahi karega mere saath. Hello? When people see we are willing to suffer for our ethics and our values, they also become convinced that these fellows won't cheat us also. Yes? So he said to me, yes, sir, one thing I am convinced now. You are honest, aadmi ho. you will not cheat me also ever. When someone is so easily willing to compromise your values, they will do it with you also in the dealing with you as well, right? Then he became one of the most loyal distributors for me. Even after I left the company, I became a pastor, still many times he used to be touch with me. And he couldn't believe that yaar, aisa bhi koi kar sakta hai. Koi paan sa rupay dene ko tiyar nia brahe. He said, sir, puri raat aap ke achchi kate ki. I know that yaar. <laughs> but I just can't do it. I can't be that brave, you know. So let's close. Yeah, let's, let's please close and uh, let's think about a couple of things. Uh, whenever God sends us the word, He wants us to respond to truth. He, he wants, you know, one of the God hates is indifference. When God sends us the word, He wants us to respond to the truth in the word. And one good way is just to talk to Him right now. The three things that I often talk to you. Right now, one of the things that you can be responding is, if there's anything in the sermon where you were, where you were helped by truth about the character of God, truth about God's ways, you can thank Him right now. And don't just say, thank you God for your ways. Be more specific. Today, Lord, in this sermon today, this particular aspect of your character, I was blessed. Thank you, Father, for reminding me this particular way of God. Be a little more specific when you are responding, please. Another thing that you can you can do in, as you respond is if the Holy Spirit convicted you of something in this sermon, you can say sorry from the heart and you can also confess God's perspective on the issue. Third, or the third thing you can also do is, Lord, help me how do I apply this sermon in my unique context in my own life. And so you can say, Lord, what is something I can pray differently? What is one or two things I can do differently? That's your time, now you can do that. Lord, I pray that you would awaken and strengthen each one to use these insights for effective private times, Lord. 
that we would all grow in having effective private times with you. And when we will find we are being changed, because we are willing to pay the price of time to meet you in private and commune with you in private. I pray, Father, that you would open eyes to see the value of presenting ourselves to you through our private times alone, through our family altar, and also by presenting ourselves to you along with the church family in the various church activities we do, whether it's Bible study or cell group or youth meeting or couples gathering. That, Lord, we would not lose out on opportunities to present ourselves to you alone with our family, with our church family. And we'll see how, as we present ourselves to you, you work in us and change us and transform us. I pray, Father, that each one will take to heart the insights to have effective private times and that in the days ahead we will see more and more that people in our church will grow in having more effective private times with you. And as we keep beholding you, the glorious God, we will be changed more and more from glory to glory in your own image. And we give you praise, we give you thanks. Tend to work in our lives, Lord. We ask and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.